Welcome to the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, episode number 180. There's never been a better time in history to make films, to make content, to make your dream come true as a filmmaker, as a storyteller, as it is now. Mongo Wilder. Broadcasting from the back alley in Hollywood, it's the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, where we show you how to survive and thrive as an indie filmmaker in the jungles of the film biz. And here's your host, Alex Ferrari. Welcome, my indie film hustlers, to another episode of the Indie Film Hustle Podcast. I am your humble host, Alex Ferrari. Today's show is sponsored by Video Blocks. Now, guys, when I was shooting my show for Legendary Pictures, uh, and I did that 96 pages in four days, I actually got into post and we used a lot of stock footage, stock sounds, and even some uh, graphics from Video Blocks. They are an amazing resource. With your membership, you are granted the rights to use that footage forever in perpetuity on any projects you want to. It's remarkable. So it's nice to know that you don't have to worry about footage or sound or music that you're downloading and using on your film, your show, your projects, your web series, whatever it is, and you can sleep easy knowing that you don't have to worry about any rights. So if you want to try a seven-day free trial, and by the way, anything you download during those seven days is yours to keep. And if you decide to stay, you get 84% off the yearly membership. It is well worth it, guys. Trust me, if you do a lot of production, it is something you really need. So just head over to videoblocks.com forward slash hustle. That's videoblocks.com forward slash hustle. So before we get into the show today, guys, I have some insanely great news on the This Is Meg front. You guys know uh, my journey with This Is Meg and getting it out there and and making it and, and distributing it and everything we've done. And, you know, the news I'm about to tell you, you know, I was floored when I heard. This Is Meg was sold to Hulu. Hulu bought This Is Meg as a Hulu Uh, original, you know, as a Hulu movie. And I cannot tell you how humbling and how amazing that is. Uh, I'm so excited. Jill and I went over the moon about it. It was one of our goals to get into uh, Hulu and we got in and I can't believe it. We're so excited, so grateful for everybody's support. And uh, and it's going to be released October 15th. On Hulu. So if you have Hulu, you'll be able to watch it on Hulu after uh, October 15th, and it'll be there for a year. So watch it. Send it to your friends. Tell everybody about it. It's really exciting. Uh, and I'll get more information about exactly, you know, links and all that kind of stuff as that information comes forward. But I just wanted to share that with you guys because, uh, it, you know, you guys are you guys are family. You know, you guys are part of the tribe, and I want to share the good news with you guys. And all sorts of other good stuff is happening with This Is Meg. The sales on iTunes have been doing really well. Same thing with Vimeo and Amazon. And I'm going to be doing a big kind of wrap up in the next few months about my entire experience with self-distributing This Is Meg. The good, the bad, and the ugly in regards to the distribution of Meg. And getting it out there and what I, I wanted to happen, what I expected to happen, and what's happening. And the wonderful surprises along the way. So I will be talking about that in the months to come. I just want to give uh, This Is Meg to get all the numbers in and really uh, dissect how we finished off with This Is Meg. And it's not really finishing off because it's going to be on there online forever uh, as long as the internet's running and it's going to continuously make revenue for me and Jill. But I wanted to uh, to kind of settle in and really get a good idea of all the platforms and how we're doing. So again, just wanted to share that amazing news with you guys. So today we have on the show Veronica Lee from Backstage Magazine. They are the leading resource for casting your films, your television shows, your series, your streaming series, everything. And it's a topic that I've not covered very often here on the podcast. Actually, I've never covered this topic on the podcast, which which is casting, which is something that a lot of filmmakers uh, and industry people in general think like like a side thought, like, oh yeah, we gotta get a casting agent to do casting. And it's such an important part of the process. When you cast properly, you don't have to direct that hard. (laughs) Like they said, you know, casting is 90% of directing. And it's true. I've worked with, you know, amateur and and more green actors. 
And I've also worked with the highest end professionals. And trust me, when you work with these really amazing, highly, highly trained actors, it makes your life so easy as a director. So I got Veronica from Backstage to come on the show and really talk about the process of casting, how you can cast for independent films, how to get the most bang for your buck when it comes to casting an actor, all sorts of things we cover in this episode. It is truly kind of a masterclass in in casting and how to cast the film. And of course, as members of the Indie Film Hustle Tribe, you guys get a free casting package worth $100 on Backstage.com. You can use all of their services for free. $100 package. So cast your movie for free. All you got to do is use the coupon code HUSTLE when you check out and get that free package. My gift to you all. Without any further ado, please enjoy my conversation with Veronica Lee from Backstage Magazine. I'd like to welcome to the show Veronica Lee from Backstage. Thank you so much for doing the show. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited. You are the first casting person we've ever had on the show. And I can't believe I've neglected casting so long on the show. And it's something I guess happens very often in the film business. People kind of forget about the casting process. Well, casting people are like very like secret squirrels, you know, they're like very clandestine and secretive. And um, I think they try to maintain a low profile, probably because we're being contacted by actors like all the time. <laughs> that's that's true. And if there's if there's a group of people that <laughs> that are are are, are, are um, eager to get into the business more than indie filmmakers, I'm going to throw out actors and writers probably. But actors you probably- <laughs> have no idea. Um <laughs> Like, I remember when I was first starting in the business, I was doing casting um, for M. Night Shyamalan in Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. And like, literally people were looking up. I mean, oh my God, I'm like giving my age away right now. But people were like looking up my family in the phone book Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and calling them and asking if they could be in his movie. It's, it's, I can only imagine. Can you imagine? Like my grandparents were like in their 80s and they were like, (laughs) what? Veronica's doing what? Who's doing who? what? What? What's... And night? Who? Night? It's nighttime. So yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's that's insane. And I, yeah, because I can, I just could imagine it's on, on when you're working on those kind of high level projects. Uh, the, the the you know actors are just desperate to get into these because they know if they could get in a movie like that, it could launch a career. It can yeah. it can take off. So it, it there's very high stakes there. But I guess you guys are. One of the many gatekeepers, but as far as the casting, you are the main gatekeeper. Well, I think it's always like, it's great to have a casting director on your project if you can afford one, or if you have a friend that's willing to do it, because it is going to eliminate some of that, um, that push, you know, that actors are going to want to reach out to you as a director, Mm -hmm. um, directly. So it's like, you kind of need the gatekeeper between you and the acting community, not to diss actors, but they can be very persistent. (laughs) That's a really (laughs) PC word you just used there. Persistent. Persistent. Yeah. (laughs) I don't, I don't want it to come off as, um, I I hate actors, but you know, it's like, it's just, um, you know, it's like I said, you know, and casting directors, we're known for being a little prickly, mm-hmm. you know, um, we can be scary and intimidating. I mean, I think that's why I've done well in the <laughs> position. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, and, and I haven't even asked a question yet. We're just kind of, just kind of riffing right now, but, uh, sorry. Uh, no, it's not it's just uh, completely. That's, that's excellent. But when, um, when I cast, I generally try to be as nice as humanly possible, to the actors because it's just brutal. It's a brutal process. That's very nice of you. I try to because as a, as as a director, you know, I, I'm just in there and, and then it's a cattle call a lot of times. Some you know, they're just actors coming in and out for a commercial or a music video or for a feature or something like that. And you know, they're out there and they've been you know they're trying and I try to be as nice as possible. But sometimes the second they walk in the room. I, I, you know, as a director, I go, they're not right for the part because they're not physically what I'm looking for, for the character or for the part and has nothing to do with them or their skill. And that's brutal. That's a brutal experience for, for somebody because it has nothing to do with them as a person or their talent as an actor. I'm like, you know, you happen to be 5'10 and white. I'm looking for 
six ten and Asian. <laughs> you know, yeah. well, that's uh, one thing that I always try. I'm trying to to impose upon indie filmmakers now um, a bit more is that um, to open your mind with casting mm-hmm. as much as possible. Um, a lot of times, like you'll you know you'll have somebody like hell bent that it's got to be like this hot you know, five, 10 blonde dude with all these muscles. Mm -hmm. And it's like, the role doesn't really require that, you know? So I'm always like really, especially like in this day and age where they're really stressing diversity casting and things like that. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, if you, if you don't get married to an idea of the visual, I think that opens up your mind to a lot more talent. Um, but speaking to what you were saying about being nice, it's like, my um my friend and a fellow casting person um Eli Cornell we uh we actually still work together he um he just he's amazing like i he's one of the people few people in the industry that i've met and i admire because you know in the casting room he's so kind and so accommodating and he's like this like 6 foot like two dude from Michigan like you'd think he'd be like really like intimidating he's just the nicest person and just so empathetic towards actors and i think that goes such a long way mm-hmm. um i struggle with it myself because after you've seen so many people you're like oh my gosh you know um but that's a really good quality to have I- just be nice you know, that's a general quality that you should have in the business because people in general want to work with nice people as opposed to asses, Right. Uh, you know, as, as a general statement. Um, well, wasn't it Conan O'Brien who said, if you work hard and you're nice to people, you'll go far. Like, I, I believe that. That's I very, it, that. It, it, it's absolutely true. It's absolutely, look at Ron Howard, you know, considered one of the nice guys in the business. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I, I've met people that have worked with him and just have nothing but nice things to say. Yeah. Like, no question. I mean, being nice is a big under underestimated quality as, as a filmmaker, right. an actor, writer, whoever. And actors are sensitive. Like we're talking. What? Sensitive. Yeah. No. No. Yeah. And they're not. They're not dramatic at all. No. <laughs> no. Stoic. Practically Winston Churchill's out there. <laughs> all right. So let's start getting. Let's let's ask a couple okay. questions. So how did you get in the business? First of all, what made you kind of jump into the, how did you get into the casting and how did you get into business in general? Okay. Um, I'm trying to think of a short way to say this. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, so I actually went to, um, college for English literature at UPenn and I jumped into graduate school. I am like a big literature nerd, but Mm -hmm. I also, um, was obsessed with, um, like film. I would use it when I was a TA, uh, teacher's assistant, uh, to teach people, um, about writing kind of as a a tool. And, um, you know, I was really obsessed with Hitchcock, Hitchcock and Truffaut and stuff when I was in college. And, um, I don't know if you know this, but the world out there for a writer right now, isn't really that hot of a commodity. Um, (laughs) Journalism. I, my first job was working at like a small newspaper just outside Philadelphia and believe it or not, it went under. No. You know? Yeah. It's you amazing. It? It's amazing. And, um, so I I went back to my um, my college and I was like, hey, like I really need a job. And there was an internship available for um, this Jamie Foxx movie. And this is so horrible. I swear I can't even remember the name of it. Oh God, it's. Um... Is in Philadelphia. Yes, um, and it's Gary Gray was the director. Yes, um, yes, it was a really bad. I, I think it was like Booty Call. No, it wasn't Booty Call. Okay, it wasn't Booty Not, Call. Yeah, it no, was one it, of those movies in the in the in the nineties uh, when Jamie no, Foxx was. It was two thousand. It was. It was? 2000, it was Gerard Butler, Jamie Foxx. Law abiding citizen. Oh, okay. Well, okay, that one. I thought it was like going far back in Jamie oh, Foxx's world. No, no, though. no. So, oh, Law abiding um, citizen. Yeah, yeah. Of course, of course. That was a good film. And. Yeah. So, okay. The first day, like I got an internship in the script department and literally I knew nothing about film sets. Okay. So I'm like walking on the set, walking around with a copy of the script. Um, (laughs) and I'm getting in the shot and the DP like, is like, you know what? (laughs) Duck down behind that, um, that box. And I was like, excuse me. And he said, duck down. I ended up having to duck down behind that box for four hours while they got the shot. And he was like, that'll teach you not to walk into a film set. You were fresh off the boat, my dear. Yeah, fresh (laughs) off the boat. I was horrified. Um, 
So then after that, long story short, I, you know how it goes in film. You just end up getting hired on the next one. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. If, it, if you're good and you weren't a complete ass and you did a competent job and they yeah. like you, they're like, well, I don't want to have to deal with someone new. I know this person. Let's just keep bringing them on. Exactly. Exactly. And um, so I got brought on to M. Night Shyamalan's, oh, God, forgive me, uh, The Last Airbender. Um, oh, sorry about that. Sorry yeah. about that. Yeah. <laughs> My dad liked it. You know, he, my dad liked it. He saw my name in the movie theater and he was like so proud. And I'm so like, he's the one that saw it. He's the one that went to the my theater. My dad set. was the one person who went to the theater and <laughs> saw it. So but I shouldn't knock it because Knight is actually like a really nice person. But yeah. um, from there, I just went on to to um, work on a Tony Danza show, which is a whole nother podcast. Mm-hmm. And um, no offense to Tony. Yeah. Uh, and then I moved to New York. And got um, I I did casting full time. Um, Very cool. And you worked. And there, I was just doing um, extras casting and day players. Yeah. Um, maybe some stunt people sprinkled here and there, and then so began the New York chapter of my life. And then you started working and you worked on films like Dark Knight Rises and uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, some very fairly large movies. Yeah, a little bit. <laughs> people might have heard like marty scorsese or uh yes so yeah. you did you work with marty um i did help with the wolf of wall street oh that must have um, been oh, well th- i mean that any look I, I would i would i would fetch him coffee so <laughs> uh i don't you know it's funny because my grandfather was really excited to see that in the theater and i was like no nope, no nope, not this one no, I don't think it's <laughs> not, appropriate. Not, pop, the, pop. <laughs> not, to, not to watch the Wolf of Wall Street in the theme. No, yeah, don't. I don't. I, I think he would have had a heart attack. So what? So what is the process of, you know, can you take us through what it's like to, to help cast or, or, or be part of the casting team of a huge, you know, $200 million movie like Dark Knight Rises or, or a big tentpole like Teenage Mutant or, or Wolf of Wall Street? Okay. Well, maybe I guess the best. Uh, the best examples I can give are like from uh, Ninja Turtles or like this CBS show, Person of Interest. Great show. I oh, miss that show. Oh, thank you. I love um, that I show. I also did not know anybody else watched that. Oh, God. Um, I love My wife and I was addicted to that show. We loved it. Wow. Okay. We're going to have to talk about that some, some other time. <laughs> um, so, yeah. Um, let, yeah. Let's focus on Person of Interest. That might be the best way to describe. Okay. Um, so one, you will never sleep the whole duration of the show. Uh, okay. It just won't happen. Okay. Um, you get a breakdown of like, you know, most of what I did was extras, but on person of interest, I also did um, day players mm-hmm. and I also did um, some stunt, like stunt stuff, like passing on people that I thought could be good to the stunt coordinator and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Um, so you have these production meetings and like person of interest was like JJ Abrams and he'd like be on the big screen up there, like, you know, talking to us like the wizard of Oz (laughs) and Jonathan Nolan just like sitting across from me. And I like, I'm not really a starstruck person, but I love the dark night. So just thinking like, wow, cool. Um, but they kind of, when the script, you know, is kind of in about to be ready, um, you know, they make a list of all the characters that they want and what you can expect with day players. Honestly, like it was literally, there was the principal casting office and they would handle it to like seven or eight o'clock at night. And then I would end up getting the people that they added to the script at like 11 o'clock at night. Oh, right then. <laughs> yeah. Oh, so I, you know, um, I basically got the last minute stuff and it was just constantly like, like I said, you, do, you just don't sleep. Mm-hmm. Um, and sometimes like on a, on a high, high paced thing like that, it just ends up being who's available. Um, isn't that crazy? Like people are dying to get on a show, but at a certain point you're like, look, can you show up tomorrow at 9 a.m.? Yeah, 9 a.m. It's more like, can you be there at 4 o'clock a.m.? Yes. Done. Yes. Booked. You're booked. I think you can act. Yeah. Can you read this line for me? Okay, cool. You're hired. You know? Um, <laughs> That's the way it works, isn't it? It is. Yeah. And I admit, like, whenever, you know, I, you know, I don't have a theater background. I mean, my theater background is like, I'm an Oscar Wilde nerd. Um, mm-hmm. But, like, 
I, I don't know a lot about acting, but I do know how people work with one another. And I do think that I have a good sense of how people can take direction, Mm -hmm. which I think, okay, bringing it back to the indie film scene, you know, I think it's really important to in whoever you're auditioning to make sure that it's somebody who can follow instructions. Like I'm talking, can they get to the place where you're holding the audition on time? Can they, you know, bring the prepared materials? That's a good sign. Um, obviously you want somebody who can demonstrate like some range, um, for you in case you want to take a scene in a different direction. Mm -hmm. Um, and I guess also just somebody that can really take your direction. If you're, you know, the director, um, dealing directly with the person, uh, you know, you just want to make sure that this is going to be somebody that you, you can get along with because you don't want somebody like, I always say to an indie film, have a backup. Interesting. Have a backup because especially if you're not paying people. Oh yeah. You know, like if it's deferred payment or, um, you know, you can't guarantee that there'll be anything but snacks and beer, um, have a backup because actors do get called for, you know, it might be the day of your, you know, your first shoot day and they get called for their first $800 commercial. Mm Mm-hmm. You know, so you want to have somebody on the back burner and I would be honest with that person. You know, I would be like, Hey, you know, um, I, I really like you and I think you could be great for this film. You know, I'd love to have you, you know, on set in case things don't work out. Um, just be kind and be honest, you know, Mm -hmm. um, I just think it's good to always have actors, even extras in your back pocket. Just in case, because it's true. Like once you've, you've, you've gathered all the troops, you're spending the money Mm -hmm. to be there for the day. And all of a sudden your main actor's not there or even a part of an act, a part of the ensemble is not there. And then now what do you do? Like you're, you're you're screwed and you lost all that money. So better to have a little bit of, 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 of an insurance policy in the background, just in case. And also I'm going to say right now, don't cast your friends. Which, like, which is the opposite of what Mark Duplass says. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, I, I just, I really like. It stinks when you see like a really good script, and you know, like I, I go to film festivals all the time, and like, I just, I see so many great scripts, but I'm like, man, this person hired everybody that they went to middle school with, which is cool. Mm-hmm. Um, but, but none of them have any acting training. And it hurts the production. I mean, I, I'll tell you, I've worked with some of the highest end, you know, Oscar winning actors. And I've also worked with people straight off the boat. Mm-hmm. And man, it's so much easier when you have a good actor. Yes. It's so much. It makes your job as a director. Just You just sit there and go, I need you to do this. Okay. And they're done in a take or two and we can move on. It's so wonderful to work with. Yeah, good, good actor. So it is under, it's underestimated by a lot also, of. It's a learning experience for you. Oh, God, you know, yes. if you set your sights on on you know working with you know really talented people in the future, you want to learn how to direct an actor properly. Mm-hmm. Just with your friend from you know your Blink One Eighty Two days or whatever, like. <laughs> I can't even imagine like my friends and any of that. They're like, I, I don't know. So yeah, I know I completely, I completely understand. It, it, it's you know, I've, I've worked with, I've, I've actually never cast friends. I don't think in any of my projects. Thank God. But I've you had deserve an award for that. I've actually never cast, and if I have cast a friend, they're actors. They're real actors. Mm-hmm. So that yeah, but yeah. I've never actually cast some a non actor in a role that I can even remember. So I knew that much. <laughs> but sometimes it works out. Like um, my friend Rob Cousinow, he he is a, a Detroit-based filmmaker, and he did this um, project with his brother that's going to screen. Don't quote me where it's going to screen, but um, mm-hmm. I don't know what it was, but his brother, when I, I watched the screener, um, I'm like, this guy's really got something. Mm-hmm. Like I think this guy really should pursue being an actor, but that rarely happens for me. I'm rarely like, wow, you should really stick with this. It happens every once in a while, but yeah. Uh, but generally speaking, try to get some high end professional actors, and a lot of times they don't have to be SAG actors. There are a lot of good actors no. who are not who are not SAG. Uh, right, that- I think that's a, a big misconception that you have to hire a SAG actor um, for them to be a quality actor. Mm-hmm. 
Um, because a lot of actors choose to stay non-union because they want to do commercials, which are not SAG. Right. And commercials, that's where the money is. Mm, yes, it is. So, and also, to me, the superior catering. Um, <laughs> yes. I've, I've been on the Wolf of Wall Street set, and I've been on a commercial set for, like, Aetna, and I'm like, hmm, I don't know. The Aetna catering is is way better because they only have to hand have that catering for two or three days exactly <laughs> not for it's, six months <laughs> right exactly you know some of the best some of the best uh, catering i've had has been on on uh tv tv shows i found really that, yeah i was i was on uh working on uh 24 or not working but i was visiting the set of 24 uh-huh. and castle and those kind of shows and I was like, wow, this is really good. But mind you, I was coming from Indie World, which, you know, catering is generally the spinning wheels of death, which are pizza. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so. I, I, I like pizza. I you know, do. I, I, I think I'd rather have pizza than like, you know, I hate it when you go to Crafty and you see like just sandwich bread and like peanut butter and jelly and you're like, damn. <laughs> That's all we got today. Right. So, um, So can you tell me a little bit about your work with Backstage and can you tell us a little bit about Backstage? Yeah. Um, so I am kind of like a jack of all trades at backstage. Um, I really focus on helping like the indie film community tap into, you know, their casting needs. Um, we have a platform, uh, where we have thousands of actors, uh, who are registered with our site and we provide casting tools for filmmakers. Um, obviously we get a lot of the higher profile stuff too, um, like we do, you know, like right now we have casting notices up for like the new Al Pacino film and all that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. But, you know, we also give indie filmmakers the opportunity to, you know, just directly connect with actors. So, um, Good. yeah, I kind of advise people on like how to make a breakdown, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, because some people are just lost. Oh, well, that's a really good question. How do you do a breakdown? Because And explain what a breakdown is because a lot of filmmakers have no idea. Okay, so you have a script and you have characters in your script. And yes, they have dialogue, but um, the actors auditioning for your roles, they need to know, you know, the backstory of the characters. They need to know, you know, pertinent information that's relevant relative to the project. I mean, I don't know about you, how comfortable you are about sharing your scripts, Mm -hmm. um, you know, before your project is, uh, like actually shooting. Um, but a lot of people, you know, you're not going to have an actor come in for an audition and read your entire script. Um, you might do that for callbacks, but a breakdown is really important because I feel like they also can really, uh, you know, I get it. Like in the film world, a lot of us just want to type something up and put it out and just throw it out in the universe and not care. Um, <laughs> right. I can't even tell you, like, I know a breakdown that was typed on an iPhone. I know it. Um, <laughs> when I see a lack of detail, I'm like, come on, man. Like, you want some good people on your project. You got to give them some meat. So I think being descriptive um, but to the point is really important. So like, for example, I'll just say like, it'll say main character. Um, I'll just say Oscar Wilde, Mm -hmm. you know, uh, charming, witty, clever, um, you know, is a closeted gay man in Victorian England. Uh, I don't know. Fair enough. That kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah, You know, as much detail as you, as much detail as you can about the character without going crazy. Right. Without going crazy. Yeah. Don't go too overboard. But that's part of my job is like, you know, like I'll, I'll see a breakdown. I'm like, Hey, okay. We're not having the actors reread war and peace here. Okay. Like I get your vision and your passion, but let's cut it a little bit, you know? (laughs) Right. Exactly. Now, um, I wanted to ask your opinion plus or minuses of using a casting director versus casting directly using like a service like backstage. Well, like I mentioned before, I think, you know, a casting director, if you can afford one is great because they are the gatekeeper. Mm -hmm. Um, I would say, especially though, if you're, I don't know, I guess I, I'm kind of thinking as I'm talking to you more about indie filmmakers. Mm -hmm. Um, I think, you know, when it comes to shooting like a scene in a restaurant and you need 25 extras, 
you really don't want to handle that yourself when you are the filmmaker or you are the producer. Mm -hmm. So in those situations where you're going to need background, I would definitely want a casting director. Um, if you're really pushing for like a project that you want to enter into a festival, um, man, hire a casting director who knows, um, to help you, you know, you're lucky if you have one as a friend. Um, right. But, uh, you know, to do it yourself though, like, let's say you're just at the phase where you're like kind of making shorts and, you know, to me, and I don't want to upset the CSA, um, casting society of America. Cause mm -hmm. I think casting directors are amazing mm -hmm. and they don't get enough, uh, shout outs. But, um, you know, I think you can, you can do it yourself. Uh -huh. now, and nowadays you can. Yes. Nowadays you can do it yourself on the level of, you know, an indie project. Mm -hmm. um, but like I said, if, if you want really some cal also, I should say too, like a casting director, probably the biggest trait of them is like, we're a Rolodex of faces and talent that you're constantly like matching up to opportunities, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so maybe you don't get out to see, you know, the theater all, all the time and you, you don't know what actors are out there and what their capabilities are, but casting directors kind of have to maintain that knowledge of who's doing what. And, you know, you never know if this person could be like, you know, Hey, this person is really good. I saw them in a play. They'd be perfect for this project. Now, so, would you agree though? And I've, and I've worked, I've done it both. I've done direct and casting directors. Do you agree though, if you're trying to find a little bit higher echelon actor with maybe a little bit more markability, uh, you really should go through a casting director unless you've got, you know, unless you've a filmmaker who have 20 fe features under your belt or a producer has 20 features under your belt and can call a, the agent directly. A casting director, a lot of times has a direct relationship with these actors and kind of cuts out the middleman. So you can get, get to actors uh, that are bigger using a casting director much easier than you trying to do it yourself. Does that make sense? Yeah, I, I do. I do think what you're saying, like the upper echelon and stuff, but also I wouldn't underestimate like the, like just the power of second and third opinions in a room mm -hmm. when you're running auditions. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're a director or you're a producer, you're not without vision, mm -hmm. you know, you can tell when somebody is like giving a good reading out, yeah, absolutely. Those upper echelon actors, if that's what you're really trying to get, um, you know, I would get a casting director, but, um, I also don't, you know, on the indie level, uh, if you're trying to save time and money, I think, you know, it can be done. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, how can an indie filmmaker's project stand out to actors when they're doing a casting call? I think, Something I always hear from actors is that they are really into like meaty roles. Meaty. That is the word they use, even though most of them are vegan. No offense. Um, <laughs> Especially here in California. <laughs> right. Um, but yeah, you know, if you give great material or you, you know, you've really invested a lot in this script, I think that's, that will attract actors to your project. Also, if you have goals. You know, if you have specific goals, like I'm aiming to get this um, into this festival. Um, and that's another thing that I think, like, I, I, you know, I always have, like, indie filmmakers talk to me that they they film their project, but they're not really sure of what what their goals are. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, maybe just do some research on film festivals and where you can get this thing screened before you even you know, shoot your project. Maybe I, I mean, I'm coming from the casting side, but also I, I do a bit of promotion for these kind of projects. So I feel like if you're telling an actor, Hey, our goal is to get this in the, you know, Atlanta film festival next year mm -hmm. that, that gives them, Oh, you know, like I might be featured in something, you know, and, and then that helps you negotiate kind of, you know, working for no pay and that kind of thing. Right, exactly, and 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 just on the on a side note, uh, what's your opinion on the whole working for pay, working for no pay, as actors are concerned? Because I find it that actors are generally one of the more abused, other than writers, are one of the most abused yeah. <laughs> people in the system, in the, in the business in general. And you know, they're just like, look, you know, you're an actor. Do do you want it on your reel or not? I'm not going to pay you anything. You know, there's that attitude, but there's also like, hey, you know, I can't afford to pay you something, but. I'm just going to at least give you gas money. 
you know, so, you know yeah. and, and, and a meal, you know, so what's your opinion on, on how filmmakers should re- actually work with actors sometimes, even if they have no money? If you have no money, the least you can do is provide them with meal, like a meal and buy them a drink after it's over, you mm-hmm. know, like if they drink, yes. um, you know, like don't just, and treat them really well. And like, you know, be sure. I can't believe how many times I encounter filmmakers who end up never even giving the copy. Um, Oh God. That's so, come on. Yeah. I did this for nothing. Like I always, like I, I talk to student filmmakers a lot and I'm like, always give them the copy. Like this is what they're doing it for. You know, like, Mm -hmm. um, that's their payment. Right. Exactly. But, um, You know, I think if you can respect their time, I mean, I have a, I don't know. I have mixed feelings on it because I'm like, I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm from the nineties. I'm not the generation um, where we did a lot of free internships. Um, (laughs) If you did, it was like, use your discretion. Mm -hmm. Um, I wouldn't do everything for free, especially if you know, you know, what did the Joker say? If you're good at something, don't do it for free. Right. Exactly. Good. That was my that, that was, was my Heath Ledger Joker impression. Yes, yeah, so it was, it was it's, it's fantastic actually. It's it's, unca- it's uncanny, uncanny. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think uh, you know use your discretion. Um, that being said, like actors, man, don't don't get stagnant. Like it drives me nuts when I see actors that are like on Instagram all the time taking selfies and all this stuff. Dude, go to a class, go to a workshop, do a student film. You know, keep like. Because if you don't use it, you lose it. Mm -hmm. You really do. So um, I would sprinkle in the unpaid work, you know? And also, you never know who you're going to meet. Yeah. That is the biggest advice, the biggest nugget of gold there is you never know who's going to be on set. And what? Go ahead. Yeah, absolutely. Like, um, years ago, um, when Backstage used to be like the industry trade publication, Brian De Palma, you know, put uh, an ad. He was like, I guess he was at NYU undergrad, Mm -hmm. you know, and backstage looking for somebody to be in his student film. And this dude who just moved to New York named Bobby De Niro. Yes. "Ah, I'm not doing anything. You know, I'll go. So what, you know, you never know who you're going to meet. Exactly. And, and, and look at that. Just because they're students now doesn't mean they're going to be students forever. Exactly. That's also a major thing that I think about all the time. Like, especially if you're in New York and LA, like, um, hello, you have NYU, you have Firestein graduate school of cinema. Um, you have UCLA, come on. Like you think that nobody in there is going to like end up directing things in the future. So exactly, exactly. I wouldn't mind being the the extra in that that little sci-fi opera that uh, Mr. George Lucas did back in the seventies. I'm sure he put oh. out a casting for that. He amounted to nothing. He's a nobody. Yeah, he's he's not doing well at all. Um, so uh, so let's say I'm a filmmaker and I'm and I want to use backstage. Can can you explain the entire process to me from like from start to finish on what I would do? Okay. So you would go to www.backstage.com and click post a job. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's pretty. It forms and you kind of just fill out your name, who you are, um, what you're doing. You post your breakdown, which is really easy because it's just like add a role Mm -hmm. um, type thing. And then um, exclusively for listeners of this show at checkout, you can enter um, hustle. Just hustle, mm-hmm. and you get uh, free unlimited casting. Oh, so, what? That's crazy. Yeah, yeah. And I'll make sure so, to put the promo code in the, in, the, in the show notes for everybody. Yeah, thank you. Um, but yeah, it's it's pretty painless. And, um, you know, so what happens is uh, the, the ad or the casting notice goes live immediately. And then one of our casting editors within a few hours, you know, goes through it and makes sure your breakdown's decent. And... You know, we have some really dedicated people on our staff that will reach out to you and say, hey, you know what? This role is a little, you know, it's a little thin. You might want to beef it up here. Mm -hmm. Um, Because I'd say that all of us on staff, like we really are advocates for indie filmmakers. So we're trying, you know, to make sure that people get the, the most out of their casting calls, if that makes sense. 
Okay. So then what's the, what's the next step in it? What happens? Uh, headshots coming in, videos? What's, what's the next process? Yep. So we have uh, a system where all the applicants, you'll be able to see, you know, their headshots, their resumes, and we have um, an internal messaging system. So that way you can communicate with the actors without, and don't take any offense to this, actors without go, giving them your personal Gmail account. Because um, <laughs> you don't want that sometimes. <laughs> yeah. Like... <laughs> I don't, I, you know, it, it, there's just, I think in this business, you have to have moments with your loved ones and your friends where you can shut it off. Mm -hmm. And when you have every actor under the sun, having access to your Gmail account, um, kind of hard to do that. (laughs) Yeah. And and, and in a lot of ways, and and it's, again, I have such a deep respect for what actors do, but sometimes, you know, there are different levels of actors, meaning that they under, they don't understand yeah. Uh, etiquette just straight up just straight up normal etiquette like hey dude don't just yell at me don't just contact mm-hmm. me without you know who who are you i get that it happens all the time through facebook you know with me it's like this etiquette like you just be nice and be but you know what do you think it's really just act- i no, it's I, everybody. This whole it's everybody. I think it's just this generation <laughs> it's like people don't have boundaries because of the internet so <laughs> i appreciate that backstage gives you those boundaries um so yeah you have to you do and it's a great that it does it's really great that it does yeah and also if you're like one of those people that gets a little bit weirded out by like people contacting you on facebook or something i always tell people you know in your breakdown include please do not you know reach out via social media channels we will get back to you through the system or something like that because you know you got to protect your uh your creative space and also can i just say if any actors are listening to this podcast please don't just blanket send your headshot without anything to to me or to a director or to a casting person who has no relationship with you if no. anything it's a turn off and it's if anything it'll hurt you if they ever see you again you know yeah. that's just again basic, basic etiquette just just and, basic etiquette and also it's like so many casting offices are going green now mm-hmm. um even agencies that they don't want the printed headshots and resume so be sure like if you're going to submit your headshot somewhere look up the the place where you're submitting and see if they actually want a hard copy cuz a lot of people don't not anymore anyway. again you don't need it right. you can have it in a cloud based system you know um so yeah. And also I, I just, I get very paranoid about my tone. I don't want it to sound like I am being discriminating to actors. I mean, I'm so grateful to actors because I wouldn't have a job, mm-hmm. um, without them. And, you know, I couldn't take, you know, the levels of rejection that they face all the time. So mm-hmm. I, I really, I admire people that, um, really stick with it. Now, once all these headshots start coming in, what should filmmakers look for in the kind of pre-screening process? Well, okay. Um, one thing I, I do recommend is asking for a candid photo to be attached. Yes. Uh, (laughs) Sorry. (laughs) So I was on, I was on a show. I'm not going to say which show it was, but, um, I had to find like this really attractive, like bikini model, um, for like a really featured scene. And like I had to find them later at night and I'd never seen this woman before and she submitted and Sadly, when she got to set, she looked nothing like her <gasps> photograph and they were not trying to be rude, but it was like, wow, she's really not attractive. Um, people do Photoshop headshots very badly. Yes. Um, so I, I like to tell filmmakers to leave a note that says, like, please include a candid photo. Mm hmm. You know, that's to be deceiving. I always tell filmmakers do not ever trust a headshot. No, never no. trust a headshot because it's an absolute lie. Yeah. Uh, and, and and I've just seen it. I've like I've had casting come in. I'm holding the headshot, and then I look at the person in front of me. I'm like, you've got to be kidding me! Like you're not right. even you're not even remotely close to this image. So exactly. uh, that can it's embarrassing for everybody involved. It's yes. just embarrassing. Don't embarrass yourself. And like I think people. I don't know, in my experience too, LA people have this really like idea of how physically attractive you need to be in films. And I think when you look at like how, how, I guess, um, how gritty filmmaking has become and how we've had such a push in seeing like real people like yes. Steve Buscemi, who has crooked teeth mm-hmm, and, mm-hmm. you know, blotchy skin, dude can act. Mm-hmm. 
you know, and I don't think there's as much discrimination that way based on, you know, you have to have like everything perfect. So mm-hmm. be a little bit comp- more competent actors. <laughs> Absolutely. And directors be a little bit more open to mm-hmm. not just getting the blonde hair, blue dye. Not that there's anything wrong with them, but, right, uh, right. but try to open it up because it's much more interesting. Uh, and uh, a perfect, great casting choice that was not originally set up that way. Shawshank Redemption. Uh, Mm -hmm. Morgan Freeman was not, Mm -hmm. his guy was named red. He was supposed to be a, an Irish guy with red hair. And I did not know that that was, that was the, that's why it's called red. That's why his, his character is called red because he was supposed to be red hair and white, uh, Irish guy. And then Morgan showed up and, and Darabont said, well, you're red, you're, you're red. And he's like, and they even make a joke about it in the movie. He's like, why do they call you red? He goes, must because I'm Irish. And they just wrote that joke in because of it. But oh, wow. he was opening up, but that was Darabont completely being open to the process and going, obviously Morgan Freeman is a better, it's, it's a perfect, it's perfect for this role, regardless if it was written like that or not. So always be open to casting yeah. because you never know what's going to walk in the door. And you know, I just want to, I just want to have a little bit of a, a plug on behalf of casting directors. You know, we've talked so much about being nice. Um, there is, uh, an indie film that is so dear to my heart called Casting By. Yeah, I, um, I saw, I saw a trailer for that. I want to actually watch that. Oh, please watch it. I wish that every filmmaker would watch it because honestly, like, so this woman, Marion Doherty, who has since passed, um, she was a pioneer in casting before, like in the 1940s, it was pretty much studios just hired these actors who they thought were conventionally attractive and put them in every single role, regardless of talent. And Marion Doherty was really like a big proponent of, I don't want to cast this guy because he might be, you know, the most attractive person. I want to cast him because he's talented. Mm -hmm. And she ended up filling like these roles that were like, you know, she cast Dustin Hoffman in The Graduate. Um, She discovered John Voight. Um, Just, she was really big on the New York law. Yeah, she's Lethal Weapon. Lethal Weapon. I mean, yeah. It's amazing what she did. And she was never recognized, you know, by the Academy for casting directors are still not recognized by the Academy for, you know, their contributions to film. And, you know, the DGA has a really big problem with casting directors being called directors. Mm -hmm. I think it's semantics, man. They really contribute a lot to (laughs) a film. Right. I don't care. Like call me a casting bunny. I don't care. Like just give me some credit, you know? Yeah, uh-huh. I'm gonna, I'll put. I'm gonna definitely put that a trailer, the, the trailer in the show notes because I want people to see it. Because I actually want to see it, and I'll find out where it's available so people can to watch it. Yeah, I think you can get it on Amazon, and it's it just blows me away. And um, I feel like uh, if you're a director and, and you treat your just like we said in the beginning, just treat, just be nice. You know, <laughs> just be nice. Somebody call Taylor Hackford and tell him to be nice. He doesn't seem very nice in that documentary. You'll see. <laughs> yes, I saw it. <laughs> so, um, should fil- should filmmakers be picky during the pre screening process, or should they? You know how how should they handle that? Okay. Well, if you get a thousand people, I would mm-hmm. not reach out to a thousand people to bring him in for auditions. Mm-hmm. Um, I would ask for a note. Uh, you know about why they're interested in the role. Um, if somebody is like, cool, I think this would be fun. And, you know, like, and they didn't really seem to read what you said, uh, I might weed them out. Mm -hmm. Um, if they have a resume, look at their resume, you know, to me, I always see any kind of, um, this might be kind of like old school, but like, I see any kind of like formal training. That's to me, this actor has been invested in their craft. They take mm-hmm. it seriously. Mm-hmm. Um, so be on the lookout for that. Have they been hired before? You know, are they consistently doing things? Can you see that on your resume? And I think that's a good starting point. Um, you know, I wouldn't, I don't know. I don't, I wouldn't, if I were on the indie level, like I wouldn't bring in that many people to read for you. Mm-hmm. Be a um, little bit pick. So then in other words, if you're on the indie level, depending on the scope of the, of the part, you can be a little bit picky and start weeding people out if you get a large amount of, of uh, headshots, which you probably will. Uh, so you you should probably just like those are great things: resume, training, uh, send them a note. How do they react to that note? It's kind of like you're almost dating. 
<laughs> you know, yes, it is like dating. You kind of like have to weed out like, you know, are they going to open the door for me? Are they going to, you know, are they going to go? Are we going? Uh, are we going onesies? Or are we going splitsies? You know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, that says a lot about the rest of that relationship. So I, yeah. th- I think as, as as filmmakers, we should actually do the same thing with potential actors, because guess what? You know, if it's a short, you might be with them for a week. Uh, if you're on a feature, you might be with them for three, four, five weeks. Uh, yeah. You really got to kind of set up that date properly before you move in together for a few weeks. You know, what's funny. Like I read recently. So I am a huge I can't believe I'm saying this in public, let alone on a podcast. Yes. I am a huge Lord of the Rings fan. OK, well, you're 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 a literature nerd. So that makes sense. Yeah, I, I Okay. Yeah. So, but I remember like when, um, you know, Lord of the Rings was first coming out and how Peter Jackson and all of his interviews was like, oh, I really stress that, you know, um, actors had to be nice people. Um, yes. Don't ask me to do a New Zealand accent. I can't yes. do it. Yes. Um, and then I just found out from Vigo or what's his name? Vigo Mortensen, like mm-hmm. a few weeks ago, he was saying how horrible it was to work with Peter Jackson. Really? I was shocked. Wow. Um, uh, yeah, I'm like, wow, he really put a big emphasis on, you know, hiring people that were nice that he could get along with. But I guess, you know, he didn't feel that he had to reciprocate it. Well, and also, too, you have no understanding sometimes of the kind of pressure a man like that would have been under on a yeah. movie of, of, of movies of that scope. And no one had ever done anything like that. So I'm not defending Peter yeah. Jackson, but a lot of times people are like, oh, he's an ass or she's an ass. I'm like, right. you have no understanding what they're dealing with and what's happening to them. And sometimes, you know, good people uh, can be asses. You know, it happens to the yeah. best of us. You know, it, yeah. it just depends on when you get them. But that's pretty damning uh, testimony. <laughs> yeah. But he did mention he's like, well, if you notice, like Peter Jackson, every, everything he's done post Lord of the Rings has just been CGI the hell out. Yes. You know, and he's like, I think he's like delusional now, which I think, you know. Well, you go down that rabbit hole and you're yeah. surrounded by that for a decade. Right. Uh, you kind of lose sense of reality. Uh, yeah. Uh, you know, and I, I get it. Like if you're completely surrounded by the chocolate factory, you have no understanding that that's just not the way the world works. Uh, yeah. But it works in your world. So why wouldn't right. it? Right. Right. Like, I don't know. I guess maybe speaking to the point earlier about not hiring your friends from seventh grade, still stay friends with them because they will keep you humble. Yes, absolutely. And remind you of who you were. Yes. Now, do do you like video auditions, which I know is a thing of of the last, you know, five or 10 years? Or do you prefer in person, uh, in person uh, auditions instead? Um, I prefer in-person auditions, but, um, you know, I know that the high profile casting directors, um, people like Alan Lewis, um, you know, really big, busy people, um, they like this video audition thing. Um, I'm just averse to, you know, I've seen so many bad self tapes. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm just like, you know how you have to like turn your phone, you know, horizontally so you don't get those black bars. Mm Mm-hmm. You know, it's like, or you send it as an attachment, that kind of thing. Like, that drives me nuts. Like, oh, indie filmmakers, in your breakdown, in your submission instructions, you should say, you know, be sure to include your um, self-tape as a YouTube link so that you're not trying to download all of these things to your computer because that can get really annoying. Yeah, especially not with one or two, but when you have a thousand. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. Vimeo yeah. link or, or YouTube link will will suffice. Yeah. Now, how yeah. long should a a, tep, a typical audition last? Um. Well, I guess it would depend on the role. Mm-hmm. Like, if you're just auditioning like a day player, um, you know, I would say, you know, the first audition it'll probably be the last audition. I would just do them, uh, have them do maybe two or three versions of a read through, mm-hmm. um, from the scene they're going to be in. Um, so that shouldn't take more than like ten minutes. Um. A lead role, you probably want to finesse that some more, see their range. So I, I, you know, you don't want to take up too much of the actor's time either because there's no guarantee that they're going to be hired yet. Mm -hmm, So, mm -hmm. you know, be respectful of that. And I honestly, I I believe that like 10 minutes is like the sweet spot. Like, I think that by that time you should know. Got it. Got it. Now, can you talk a little bit about callbacks and what they are and why they're so important? 
Um, yeah. So callbacks are, so you kind of, it's process of elimination. So you have your first round of auditions. You're like, okay, I like this person, like this person, I like this person. And, you know, I hope that you have your pens and pencils out and you are making notes. Um, or iPads. Or iPads. Um, <laughs> I'm from the nineties. I'm going to still keep plugging paper. Um, <laughs> But yeah, like, especially if they end up bringing headshots and resumes, that's really helpful to like, you know, scribble your thoughts and notes. Um, oh, this is something I really want to say though, because I see indie filmmakers do this a lot. Dude, don't audition people in your apartment. Oh, it's so creepy. So, it's so creepy. So it's creepy. really creepy. Like, <laughs> come on, man. Like Starbucks, like find a quiet corner, the library, somewhere public, mm -hmm. like, Watch an episode of Dateline. Crazy things happen in this world. <laughs> Find a professional environment of some sort, an office, a, a, a conference room, or rent. If you're in L.A. or New York, you can rent a casting space by the Absolutely. hour. Absolutely. And they're like Ripley Greer. I mean, they literally have rooms available for $15. Yeah. Like Ripley Greer um, is a, a studio space in New York. Like you can mm -hmm. get it for an hour for 15 bucks. Like just be professional. Like – you know, you don't want to horrify some. Oh, it happens all oh, the time. I know, I know, I know. It's it's horrifying. I've never cast in my house. I've never in my all my years. I've always I'm always surprised who thinks this is a good idea. And it and that's generally on the actor side. If the director is casting at their house, that's also a, a that's also a dating situation on the other side of the fence. Like this is probably not going to go well. That says yeah. a lot about that says a lot about the production and says a lot about the filmmakers involved that they're just not their etiquette is they're just not there yet they're they're a little too fresh uh, yeah. and a little too green if you mm -hmm. so if if an actor's listening to this and they say hey we want you to you know unless look unless it's Christopher Nolan and he wants you to come to his house different conversation <laughs> I, I don't know I don't know <laughs> well may, well Christopher Nolan maybe I don't know I don't know I'd go I'd go but that's just me. <laughs> Yeah, I don't I don't know. Maybe Roman Polanski's house. Stay Ooh, away from that. You know what? I didn't think about that. You know what? Just always go to a professional environment. Yeah, always go to a per you know, like you never know. <laughs> I'm telling you, I watch Dateline every Friday, you know? Keep it fresh in your mind. <laughs> now what what final tips do you have for filmmakers uh auditioning actors in, as a general statement? Um oh well you did ask me about callbacks. Yes. Like, I'll in brief to say, you know, that is your final and I would absolutely, if you didn't have someone with you before, you know, have a second opinion there that will help you really narrow down um, who you want for this role. And remember what I said, have backups, especially mm -hmm. if you are no budget production, because you never know if that's going to be that actor's first day on a big budget thing. So, um, yeah, that's my spiel about callbacks um, and backups. Uh, tips for filmmakers auditioning actors as how to handle how to how, how do you like handle an audition if they've never auditioned anyone before what's the process that a, a good audition should kind of go through okay well i i don't think that there should be too much personal back and forth because this is a job mm -hmm. you know when you go on a job interview you know for a regular corporate job you know you don't sit there with the boss and ask them personal details about their life irrelevant like an actor is like someone that you're going to have to mold for your role. Um, be as professional as possible and direct, you know, maybe two minutes. Because it's scary. Mm -hmm. It's scary for them. You know, like um, it's intimidating and, you know, make them comfortable. Like I said, professional space. Um, you know, you can ask in advance if you prefer them to prepare their own monologue, which I'm not really into um, at the indie level because, I mean, like, let's say someone comes and they're saying, like, you know, Shakespeare for you. Yeah, I And you're like, uh... yeah, you don't want that. Mm -mm. You're not doing a period piece and you don't need to hear their British accent. You don't want somebody, you know, coming with that. You could offer them suggestions in advance of monologues that might be like similar. Like, let's say you were shooting something like Coen Brothers asks, you, you know, you might say prepare a monologue from like, I don't know, the big Lebowski. Mm -hmm. um, so that way they're, they're getting to the, to the point of what you're doing. Cause you know, they don't know, they don't know what you want. You know, they're not mind readers. So yeah. Uh, I, I can't, definitely... I, 
I, I personally can't stand monologues. I can't because it's not relevant to what I'm doing as a, as a, a, this project. Generally speaking, as a director. So if you can provide, which is great because backstage we allow you to upload the the script sides yes. um, if you'd like to, and um, so you can have your own script sides up there so that they can just come in, you know, have it ready, um, or you can do a cold read. Some people like cold reading. Um, I think it makes a lot of actors nervous mm -hmm. um, but it's when a they're new. It's a skill, though. You have to have it as a skill as an actor. Yeah, you, you have never to have know. it. So, um, I always like sending sides. Sides is generally the, the way I like to do my castings. Like, send a side, let the actor prepare for a night, and come in, and that's it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I think that's good because, um, you know, I if I, like, had my, my script sides, if I was writing a script and – auditioning someone, I would give them like three chances and three passes at the script mm -hmm. and maybe give them some direction, you know, like have them read through it the first way that the way that they would interpret it. Maybe the second way, Oh, can you make it, you know, could you give me a little bit more sadness? Um, you know, can you give me a little bit more anger in what you were just saying and then do it a, a third way? Got it. Yeah. Now I have this one question and, and this is, this is a, a touchy subject. So I've always, I always wanted to hear a casting director's um, point of view on this. If you're casting a part that has nudity in it, that has um, male or female, either one, uh, has some sort of nudity in it, uh, or is an exposed uh, part, meaning like a bikini, um, or you know they're half naked in one way, shape, or form, how do you process? How do you kind of approach that situation in a casting environment? Because I've I've literally been in a casting where they were casting a, a, a they, we were casting a, a a film for with strip clubs, and yeah. literally strippers would come in and bunch of them, and then you've got the horny dudes in the car. I'm like, dude, this is not. I felt so uncomfortable. Well, uh, one, you need you. I absolutely in a situation like that. Yeah. Um, you need a female casting director God. by your side or a female producer. Someone a there, female yes. friend, yep. a female. Um, and wow, this is like one of my favorite subjects because I have done some crazy nudity casting. Like, mm -hmm. I don't know if you saw The Dictator with Sasha yes. Baron Cohen. Oh my God. Can you imagine? I can only imagine the casting you had to oh, do. Oh, <laughs> like you saw um, Busty Hart. You know who I'm talking about? Uh, in the I'm, movie I do, yes. Yeah. So um, there were some requests from Sasha, who is such a cool person to work with. But um, wow, like there was a lot of nudity casting and I really do think in that regard, um, you need a woman's touch around for that. Even just, you know, for legal purposes, man, you don't want somebody to be like, you know, accusing you of, of something. But, mm -hmm. um, so what I will say in your breakdown, first of all, be totally upfront and clear about the nudity. Okay. Mm -hmm. Like don't try to surprise anybody with that. Mm -hmm. Second, don't ask for pictures online. Like, <laughs> Don't do that. I know, um, I know. Like I told you that um I helped with the Wolf of Wall Street. Oh I god. Mean, that was they were some Polaroids. That's what I'll say. They were some they were they were Polaroid pictures oh. that got submitted to Marty. Um oh, that's just not what the hell? <laughs> yeah. It was something. Um but yeah, you know, don't don't request, you know, oh, we're gonna need to see a photo of you topless. Um at the audition, I would reiterate, you know, um, I just want to clarify that there is nudity required for this role. Never ask someone to take their clothes off at the audition. Mm -hmm. I just don't do that. Like, I, I think this is like a very touchy, touchy subject because also it's like we live in the United States of America. You can pretty much get sued for anything. This is true. Um, you know, so you don't want that to mess up your whole project. And mm -hmm. it always comes down to. You know, he said, she said, it's, mm -hmm. it's a job, it's professional. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, um, sometimes, like I'm saying, like in the case of Wolf of Wall Street, you know, the director wants to know what he's getting in advance. So I recommend Polaroids for that. And I recommend a woman to handle that. Mm -hmm. um, I know that might sound kind of sexist, but actually casting is one of the few female dominated uh, fields in the know, business. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's also because um, I just was talking to uh, this commercial casting director, Melanie Mack. She's awesome. And she was just saying how she just thinks like because women are so inherently 
nurturing that, you know, we're kind of better at accommodating those spaces. Mm -hmm. Um, but does, does that help you? Like, it, does that answer your question? It does answer my question. So, and, and I guess a lot of that would go the same way with like, if it's a bikini shoot, you know, I guess you could ask for bikini pictures, but I don't know when you would ask for them when it became appropriate. And I think a lot of the, the things you laid down, having a female handle it makes the most sense. Uh, but a lot of that's, you know, that, um, you know, you can request a candid full body shot. Um, you know, I would say in, inform to use respectable language. I mean, yes. I can't even tell you some of these background or these breakdowns that I see. I'm like, Oh my God, dude, are you serious? Like, <laughs> I hope this is not what you have like on your Tinder profile because. Oh you know. my God. Um, but you know, like you can get a pretty good sense of someone's, you know, figure. If you say, you know, do you have professional full body shots in form fitting clothing? That's a professional way of asking, Hey, I, I need to see what you look like. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, Cause I know that's a really touchy subject for a lot of filmmakers and especially early on in, in their career, they won't know how to handle that situation. And I wanted to kind of, you know, have someone like you say, Hey, this is the way you guys really should do this. Yeah. And it really stinks because like my favorite genre of film is horror and I love indie horror and like, you know, I like help people from trauma. I don't know if you're familiar with oh, that. We, uh, Lloyd's a friend of the show. <laughs> oh, okay. Hi, um, so, uh, yeah, like, you know, I love horror filmmakers. I love the genre, but let's face it. It is like the number one genre for topless women running around screaming their heads off. Yes. Um, so I, you know, I'm always like trying to help guys that make shows like that. Like, dude, you can't say that in your breakdown. <laughs> like you can't. I I can't even repeat the things that they you know they say. say. I got yeah. you. I got you completely. They're harmless dudes. They're totally harmless. It's just you know they're used to growing up with you know Tromeo and Juliet, and they think that's how you you know you speak in a breakdown, and it it is not. It's still professional. <laughs> Very cool. So I'm going to ask you um, same questions I ask all of my guests, and these are the Oprah questions. So prepare yourself. <gasps> Oprah. Okay, so uh, what advice would you give a filmmaker wanting to make their first feature film? What advice would I give a filmmaker wanting to make their first feature film? Feature film? Is that what you said? Yes. Feature? yes. Okay. Um, man, you really have to love it. <laughs> like, you really have to love what you're doing. Like, yes. you have to be in love with it. Um, and I say that for anything in the arts. Um, you know... It, you're not going to last if you don't love it. Uh, it's because it's too brutal. <laughs> it's brutal. It's hard. And, you know, we talk about being nice to actors because they face rejection. You know, you got to – you're going to face some rejection too. So be prepared for it because we all think that our projects are awesome and, you know, our, our blueprint in the world. But, you know, there are people that are going to slam doors in your face and just be ready for it, you know, and remember why you love it and remember why you're doing it. I mean, look, Spielberg couldn't get Lincoln off the ground. <laughs> it right. took him forever to get Lincoln off financed. So if if Spielberg's having issues, chances are you and I will probably have some issues right, getting exactly. our project off the ground. Exactly. Now, now, can you tell me what book had the biggest impact on your life or career? What book? Mm -hmm. Like on my life and my career? Wow, mm -hmm. this is like Oprah. <laughs> um, I would probably say Oscar Wilde's Deep Profundis. Mm -hmm. which is um, a love letter that he wrote in prison. Um, I won't get into it, but I'll, I'll give you, I'll give you the radio friendly answer. Mm -hmm. uh, Sounders, the catcher in the rye. Got and it. I can tie that into indie film because I really believe that you will never be able to successfully translate Salinger into a film. I truly believe that. Right. But also he blocked it. He, he was so against movies that he was like, no, it, like he legally set out before his death that none of his works could be made into film. Interesting. Very yeah. interesting. Now, what is the lesson that took you the longest to learn, whether in the film business or in life? Wow. Oh my gosh. These are good <laughs> questions. I appreciate it. <laughs> How did Oprah have a job for so long? Like, here you go. <laughs> um, a lesson. Uh, this is going to sound really like trite, Mm -hmm. But like, honestly, 
like at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter. Like mm-hmm. just let things go. Nothing's work, you know, like yes. just let it go. Life is way too short, man. Like it's really short. And the things that we get upset about, uh, the, it's just, it's not worth it. Just let it go. You know, uh-huh. that's a great advice. That's- and I feel like when I was working in the film industry, um, more hands on than I am now, you know, I was casting like Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and Person of Interest simultaneously. And I was so stressed. But um, and this is, you know, something that I really want to say to anybody, an actor or a producer or a filmmaker, whoever is in this business, don't take it personally. Don't because, Mm -hmm. you know, I really internalized a lot of the stress and I didn't need to, you know, Mm -hmm. it's supposed to be fun. Making films is supposed to be fun. And, um, yeah, like don't take it so serious. Why so serious? Why? Another Heath Ledger. Another Heath Ledger. (laughs) Now, what are three of your favorite films of all time? Ooh, okay. I'd say probably number one, um, until the light takes us, which is a documentary about the Norwegian black metal scene. Nice. Um, I love documentaries and okay. I love Norwegian black metal. Um, <laughs> so you're, you're, you're an onion. You have multiple layers, Veronica. Yes, I do. <laughs> um, I'd say second is, um, let the right one in the, oh, that's which one is that one? Swedish vampire film with yes, two kids. Yes, yes. Um, they remade it. They remade it. Yeah, they remade yes, it in English. Yes. Which I never want to see it because it didn't need to be remade. Oh, <laughs> made me so mad. Yeah. Um, uh, I'm going to say right now, just because it's off the top of my head, mm-hmm. um, The Crow. Oh, I love The Crow. Oh, yeah. It's so it's sh- good. Oh, maybe that's tied with like The Dark Knight. Okay. It okay. was like surreal for me because like I did, I worked on that scene in the dark Knight rises that took place on wall street where it was like mm-hmm. Bane fighting mm-hmm. Batman and everything. And that was, that was a really huge moment for me being like a huge fan of that franchise. Yeah. Um, that was cool. But yeah, I, I think that's that. And you know what? I was just thinking yesterday, I'm like, man, I got to rewatch that because I feel like so many themes of the dark night, which came out what, like 10 years ago mm-hmm. are like relevant now. Right. Oh yes. Very, scary. very, very, very much so. And the crow is, is a classic and, 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 you know, it's, it's so good. It was so it's good. So good. And just Brandon Lee was amazing with Ugh. the stunts and, Um, his delivery of that character and just a beautiful creative film. And I just think, you know, um, musically, you know, I miss the days of the soundtrack. Remember when you used Mm -hmm. to like see movies? It's a great soundtrack. Such a great soundtrack. Nobody does that anymore. No. That stinks because I really loved that. The Um, old soundtracks. That was an awesome, amazing soundtrack. Nine Inch Nails song on there. Oh. Oh, so good. So good. Now, where can uh, where can people reach out to you online? Not your personal right. Gmail, but <laughs> not my personal Gmail. Um, okay, so um, let me say my Twitter is at cleveronique thirty seven. Mm-hmm. Um, I'll spell that. I'll put it. I'll put it in the show. Yeah, notes. you can put it up. And um, my Instagram is a Norwegian word, Vaishas Veronique. Um, I'll send it to you because okay. I know these are very difficult things to spell. <laughs> I'm a difficult kind of lady. <laughs> Not a problem. Veronica, thank you so much for all of your uh, your knowledge bombs you dropped on us today. I really thank appreciate it. Thank you for it. having me. It was really awesome. Guys, casting is such a huge part of the filmmaking process and it's something that people really don't think about and they just cast their friends, which is fine sometimes. But generally speaking, you want to get professional actors and actors who really know what they're doing and casting the right actor or actress for the part is so huge. So I hope you got a lot out of this episode with Veronica from Backstage. And again, if you guys want to get a free casting package, literally just use Backstage's amazing resources and get bumped up higher. You get a full $100 package for free. Just go to Backstage.com and when you check out, use the coupon code HUSTLE and you'll get the whole package for free. And if you want links to anything we talked about in this episode, head over to IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash 180 for the show notes. Oh, and by the way, I have been getting inundated with letters for the Stephen Pressfield book giveaway contest that I have been that I set up a few weeks ago. 
and I've been waiting to get more and more letters in, and I've just been inundated with a bunch of letters. So I'm going to get the winners out and read them out in a special episode of the podcast coming up soon, and uh, we'll ship out those books and some extra surprises to the winners. So thanks again for everybody's story. It is amazing to hear uh, your stories of triumph and defeating resistance and that little voice in your head that says you can't do it. When you beat that voice and beat him down well, amazing things can happen to you. So as always, guys, keep that hustle going. Keep that dream alive, and I'll talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to the Indie Film Hustle podcast at IndieFilmHustle.com. That's I-N-D-I-E-F-I-L-M-H-U-S-T-L-E.com.